So over the next couple of weeks, as we continue in this uh, book of Acts, we're going to be reminded of the great power of the gospel to save all different types of people. Uh, last week, Pastor Tyler walked us through the story of Lydia, a wealthy woman in Philippi who met Christ and was immediately baptized. Next week, we're going to see a, a blue-collar average guy working a job as a prison guard, and he and his whole family are going to be saved and baptized. And today, we're going to see a story of a slave girl who's neither rich and wealthy like Lydia, nor is she blue-collar like this Roman guard, but she's a slave. And to top it off, she's a demon-possessed slave. So a rich, upper-class woman, a blue-collar Roman prison guard, and a poor, demon-possessed slave girl walk into a bar. Right? And that's what this kind of sounds like right now. We've got these three totally different people, and this church are going to be the very first three members of the very first church ever planted in Europe. That's incredible to me. That's incredible that these three completely different types of people and their families are saved by the mercy and grace of God, and then a church is born, the very first one in Europe. This is what God's grace is all about, saving people from every tongue, tribe, and nation, from every uh, wealth class, from every background. This is what God does. This is the business that he's in, is saving the unlikely and bringing them together in a church and causing them to become a family. And it's incredible the way that the gospel works. I look at my own life. I look at the last 26 years of my life as a Christian and all the different random people that I was in churches with over the years. And I just think, how is it that we hung out together and did life together? And it doesn't matter what kind of background or anything you're from. When, when the blood of Christ unites a people, it, just, it does miraculous things in our hearts and our lives. It's a beautiful thing. So I want to pray And we're going to look at this specific story today, very interesting story, kind of a a bewildering story, just going, what is going on here? But I want to pray and ask the Lord just to lead us and guide us as we go through his word, to give us wisdom, to give us discernment, so that we can be the kind of church that the Lord would want us to be on this earth. Father, I thank you that you've given us your word You've given us all these incredible stories, these diverse stories that have been chronicled by, by, by men like Luke who wrote Acts and by the other gospel writers, by Paul. We have these stories as encouragements for us, but also uh, reminding ourselves that these, this word is living and active. It's not just a history book. It's not just a, just a, a collection of stories telling us about what you've done But this word is alive. It's living, active, and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. And it brings conviction of sin. It brings encouragement in times of discouragement. It shapes how we see ourselves, how we see you, our identity in Christ. It empowers us. And so we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would lead us into your truth today, that your truth would find a home in our hearts, that it would go to work in the the dark recesses of our hearts, shining light in those dark places. We want to leave here just even just a little bit different than when we came in here. I mean, we want to leave here a lot a bit different, but but even just a little bit different. We want to walk out of here just seeing you more clearly, knowing you better, having our mind transformed just a little bit more. So Holy Spirit, would you work in us by the power of your word and the strength of its truth and in the mighty name of Jesus, amen. So Acts chapter 16, verse 16 here. This is Luke writing. He says, as we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination. And she brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. 
And she followed Paul and us, and she was crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. And Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and he said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. So Luke's telling us this story of this slave girl who had this, what he calls a spirit of divination. This means that just by some kind of demonic influence, she was able to, at least in some form or fashion, foretell of some kind of future events. And so she was used as property, as a tool by her owners to make money off of her. So they would parade her around. People would come to these owners and say, hey, we're going to give you money if your little slave girl could tell us a little bit about our future. So they would make a great profit off of her, using her as a tool. And this phrase here, the spirit of divination, uh, in, in Greek is literally, it means a spirit of python. You're going, that sounds really scary. A python spirit. There was this ancient uh, Greek myth that was very popular in this time for actually hundreds of years. It was a popular myth that there was this python, a a mythical serpent who lived in the center of the earth and he would protect this area that would, uh, in, in, in Greece, he would protect this area that would give you powers to be able to tell the future. But eventually Apollos comes along and he kills the python And so from that point on, it was believed that uh, when there was particular women that could have this ability to tell the future, they were said to uh, have have the spirit of Python. So if there was women going around and they were kind of prophesying, able to kind of tell the future, they would say that she had a Python spirit. So the slave girl was possessed by a demon. And because of the cultural beliefs of the Greeks, they believed that she had the spirit of Python in her. So she was sought out by the people. She was revered by these people. They're like, she has the spirit of Python. We can go pay money and get info and some intel on our future. And this is what they would do. And her owners made money off of her. So this girl, she was doubly enslaved. Enslaved by her masters who exploited her. And she was enslaved by demons as well. She was enslaved doubly. So, so what's going on in this story here? Why, why is she affirming the gospel? That seems very strange, right? You, you think that if she's affirming the gospel that Paul would be like, oh, this is so cool, but it says that Paul was annoyed. Why was Paul annoyed with her affirming the gospel? What she was saying was true. She's given her stamp of approval on these guys. She was well regarded in town, at least to some degree. She was sought after, maybe we might say. So her endorsement of the gospel would be very helpful to the apostles. Wow, the spirit of Python, that girl, she endorses these guys. We should listen to these guys. She knows the future. She's in with these guys. That's a good thing. We should, that that, that makes sense. That's like having a celebrity endorsement. That's what this is like. But Paul, he shows great wisdom here because he's reading between the lines. Something's up. Something's just not right with this girl. He knows there's something going on. There's the work of the enemy somehow. And the work of the enemy, somehow he's going to use this ultimately to undermine the gospel. Maybe Paul doesn't know exactly how or why or whatever, but he knows something's off with her. And rather than aligning himself with her, he, after a few days, he's like, I'm annoyed with this. this. This has to stop. So he's seeing something about what's going on with this girl. Even though she's speaking truth, he knows something's not right. And he doesn't want to align with her. And one of the greatest enemies, the, the, the enemy's one of the, his greatest ploys for us. One of the greatest things he does is he works in subtlety. He works very carefully. Had this girl come out outright and just said, these men are wicked, evil doers. Paul would have just looked at her and said, hey, be gone. But instead she's like, oh, these men proclaim the gospel. You should listen to them. The enemy using her is being sneaky trying to infiltrate this work of the gospel through the back door. Not trying to come in through the front door and trying to say, hey, you guys don't know what you're talking about. She's trying to kind of become one of them, sneaking into the ministry. But after some time had passed, it says a few days this went on, Paul and company, their their suspicions were, were kind of getting confirmed. 
They had these suspicions that something was a foul. Something's not right with this girl. And so eventually they rebuked the spirit. Now, this isn't the first time we see a, a serpent subtly change and twist truth, is it? Right, we go back to Genesis chapter 3. Look at verse 1 here. It says, The serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. The serpent is crafty, church. He's not going to come out and just be obvious in your life. You'd see that from a mile away. But he's crafty. And he said to the woman, to Eve, Did God actually say, number one, he will always get you to question God's word. Always. He won't outright say that God's word isn't truth. He, he, he knows you're smarter than that. But he will get you to question it. He'll, he'll, he'll cause just a little seed of doubt. Did God, did he actually say, you shall not eat of the tree in the garden? And the woman, she said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. Okay, so far so good. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the midst of the garden. So far, so good. Neither shall you touch it. That's not true. That's not true. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Now, there's a, there's a partial truth there, because it's not instant death, but it's a gradual death. So there's... A kind of a partial truth there. You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened. That part's also true. And you'll be like God, partial truth, knowing good and evil. That part's true. So we've got this mixture of true things, but just subtleties that aren't true. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise... She took of its fruit and she ate and she also gave some of it to her husband who was with her and he ate. So this is like, this is like a Trojan horse. If you remember that story, if you know that old story, right, where the Greeks were trying to conquer the city of Troy after a 10-year siege that wasn't going anywhere. And so what they did to kind of say, hey, we give up. Here's a little gift for you guys. They built a big horse on wheels and it's going to be like a big trophy. But they hid inside of this horse. So when the Greeks retreated, under the sea, then Troy was like, hey, cool, let's bring this cool horse in, brings the horse in, but they didn't know there were some Greeks hiding inside the horse. So they bring him into the city beyond the walls, and then at night, then the Greeks came back secretly at night on the sea, and what happened was the Greeks that were in the horse come out of the horse, they unlock the gates, open the gates, and now the whole Greek army comes in, destroys Troy. Just deception, subtlety, trickery, kind of a backdoor entrance. There is just enough truth in something. This is what happens, some, just enough truth. So we accept it into our life. It looks good. Look at this cool trophy horse. But what happens is the enemy then infiltrates through it. There's enough truth to get us to fall for it. Maybe something that, that looks Christian, it, it sounds Christian, it feels Christian, just enough for us to buy into it, but it's not necessarily Christian, at least not fully. Or maybe it's just off enough, and we should be wary about that. So let's put this in today's terms a little bit. There's going to be a number of times when you're faced with different situations, maybe not necessarily demon possession, but situations where someone seems, at least on the outside, to be speaking truth. You go, gosh, this is a great message. They seem to be saying the right things, but there's just something that just seems a little bit off. There's a kernel of truth in what they say, and so you tolerate it, just at least for a little while, just like these guys did, Paul and company. But there's something afoul. There's something that just doesn't seem right. There's maybe a bad attitude, something that just isn't right about them. And while you know you can't totally trust your gut completely because you might be off too, right? You might just be assessing the situation wrong, but you definitely you take note, and you pray, and you compare your concerns with what you see in Scripture. You get counsel from others, and you watch for the fruit of that person or that ministry or that, that book or that author or whatever it might be. You look for the fruit in their life and kind of take an assessment. It's phenomenal to me how often I can totally agree with someone or something. But there's something about them I can't agree with. And I, I can't quite put my finger on it. It might be an attitude. It might be a, an arrogance. 
maybe a, a self-righteous condescension, maybe they look down on others, maybe mockingly, maybe they're aloof or smug or pompous. It might just be their overall tone or their lack of tact. Something about, I'm just going, I love what they're saying. I just don't love something about what's going on here. It just doesn't seem right to me. Maybe a motive that seems off. I mean, we see that everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. And I can't just totally align myself sometimes when I see some of these people or authors or ministries or whatever it might be. I can maybe align with their general message, but not with, not with them, I just go, I just don't know if I want to be attached to the hip with that person or that ministry or whatever it is. And the reason for that church is because I don't want to become like them and made into their image. I love their message sometimes. I love, I love this demon girl's message. That's weird, right? I don't think I've ever said that out loud. I love a demon girl's message. But I do. She's saying, these men proclaim the way of salvation. Yes and amen. But do I want to align myself with the demon girl? Probably not, right? So, so this is a weird thing that we get into in life because whether it's friends, whether it's coworkers, whether it's whatever it is, you just go, I, I, I like a part of that, but something just feels a little off and I don't wanna become like them. I love their message, but I don't wanna become like them because attitude and the heart and the method, all those things, the method and attitude of delivering the message of Christ can be a major stumbling block for those who are already opposed to Christ, who are already opposed to the gospel, right? We can have a great message, but the way that we deliver our attitude, our tone of voice, all those things can be a stumbling block between that person who does not know Jesus and Christ himself. And I don't wanna take that on. There is a huge difference, huge difference between the message of the gospel being a stumbling block versus the messenger of the gospel being a stumbling block. Huge difference. Church, the gospel is always gonna be offensive. Always, always, always. But that does not give us the right to then personally be offensive. There's no spiritual gift. There's like the spiritual gift of jerkiness. That's, that's not a spiritual gift. Well, the gospel is just offensive. No, no, no. The gospel is offensive, but that doesn't mean you're supposed to be just a jerk. You can't hide behind that. Huge difference between the message of the gospel being a stumbling block and the messenger of the gospel being a stumbling block. Because the gospel will always be offensive. But if my attitude, if my self-righteousness, if my legalism, if my tone of voice, my pride, if my arrogance towards the world is offensive, then I'm robbing the gospel of the glory that it deserves. I'm putting a stumbling block in front of the gospel. And that should not be the case. And I better not dare blame the gospel on that, saying, well, hey, the gospel's offensive. Yes, it is, but that doesn't mean that we can just have carte blanche and act however we want because we're just speaking the truth. That's not how that works. This reminds us of just a few weeks ago when we looked at 1 Corinthians 13, right? You can have all the knowledge in the world, the best theology ever, even be able to move mountains with your faith. You can have all knowledge and tell the future just like this girl has the ability to tell the future. But if you have no love, it's nothing. You can have the most pure, clean version of the gospel that you present to people, but if you don't deliver it in the method and manner of Christ himself, it's nothing. That will become a stumbling block between those people and the gospel. It's not the gospel that's the stumbling block, it's you. It's me, it's my attitude, my pride, my self-righteousness, the way I look down on others, forgetting that I was once in their same shoes. How dare I act that way? I do not wanna be a stumbling block in between people and Jesus. I don't mind if Jesus is a stumbling block, if the gospel is a stumbling block, I know that's gonna happen, but I don't wanna be the stumbling block. Now, we don't know exactly what it was that annoyed Paul but he knew there was something wrong here. He knew that somehow there was a stumbling block lurking in the darkness of this girl's life. And if he aligns himself with her, something's gonna become a stumbling block between Paul's listeners and the gospel. So he knows that somehow if I align with this girl, she has a good message, but something's wrong. We can't align with her because this is gonna be a problem later. I don't know what, I don't know what Paul was thinking. I don't know what he saw here, but something annoyed 
him about what she was do, excuse me, doing. And it could be tempting sometimes for us to maybe look the other way. It could have been tempting for them to look the other way. Gosh, I mean, she's well known. She's famous in her own town. People go to her, I mean, for her services. So if she's now proclaiming the gospel with us, this could be really good for us. Maybe we should align with her. Use her clout in town. Use her popularity in town. It could be quite tempting to align with her or at least take advantage of the free advertising. But in doing so, they know that they would also be aligning themselves with the other parts of her and ultimately that would compromise the gospel, the integrity of the gospel towards their listeners. So we think today, even think about like celebrity culture. And we might see celebrities make professions of faith. And I, I hope, I always hope that those professions of faith are genuine. And, I, and I, I know I judge, I know I judge, but I try not to judge whether or not those professions of faith are genuine. The problem is sometimes we see their faith and the weaknesses of their life play out in the public arena, right? And so sometimes they, because they're famous, because they're popular, then they become kind of like the Pied Piper and Christians can go after them as influencers. Look, so-and-so is a Christian now. Look at that, how great is that? But then what happens? Well, there's some kind of scandal in their life and it does harm to the gospel. Or maybe churches or teachers Christian teachers, authors that seem to be proclaiming Christ, at least on the surface. Maybe it's a Christian counselor, or a Christian school, or a Christian business, or a Christian church, or author. And they're popular. They have engaging messages, but something's just off. You don't know quite what it is. I mean, look at the past you know, 15 or so years and some of the big fads that have kind of come and gone. I mean, you think of that book, The Shack, or, or the Jesus Calling series, or Love Wins, those kinds of things. Enough truth and enough Jesus to make it intriguing and compelling, but it's off. Look what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 12 through 15. He says, what I'm doing, I'm going to continue to do in order to undermine the claim of those who would like to claim that in their boasted mission, they work on the same terms as we do. Paul's like, I want to, I want to work to undermine these people who are professing a false gospel. They say they're doing the same thing. The slave girl's saying, oh, follow these guys. But in order to undermine the claim of those who would like to claim that in their boasted mission, they work on the same terms as we do. No, they don't. They don't. Their motive's different than us. Their methods are different than us. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it's no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. This girl is disguising herself as an agent of righteousness, as an apostle of righteousness, a servant of righteousness. Another phenomenon that we see a lot, and I'm not, not making a political statement here at all. I'm probably going to get in hot waters by saying it, but that kind of comes with the territory of my life, so... But something I've noticed a lot in the past couple of years, I've never seen, for instance, a president have so much influence on the church of Jesus Christ than Donald Trump. And I'm not saying his policies, I'm not saying the things that you know, he's for, but a lot of times like we, we hear this like before he's elected, I don't like his attitude, I don't like his morals, I don't like his arrogance, his mouth, but I like his policies. That's all well and fine, that's totally great, that's wonderful. But then what happens, and what has happened a lot, so many, even Christians, started to become like him in their arrogance, in their words, in speaking crudely and crassly about opponents, belittling the other side, mocking people. And then Christians celebrate that. Yeah, I just like him because he just tells it like it is. But then he emboldens Christians to act the same as him, and they become conformed into the image of Donald Trump. I'm not talking about his policies. I'm not talking about whether you vote for him. That, that, that doesn't matter to me. But what happens is, is when we start becoming like people who we shouldn't become like, even if we agree with them, even if they're speaking truth, even if they're doing good things, but when we align ourselves, we have to be careful with how much we align with certain people, certain things, certain churches, certain whatevers, because then that becomes a stumbling block for others. It's not the gospel that's become the stumbling block, but this arrogant, rude, dismissive attitude 
As Paul says in 1 Corinthians, it doesn't matter if, if truth is spoken. If it's spoken in a sinful way, we need to be careful. Now, I, I hope you all know that by now, especially for the last three years, you know that I'm an equal opportunity button pusher. Right? So the same exact thing could be said about the church being influenced by the exact opposite. Right? We've got this kind of extreme thing over here that the church has been radically influenced by. The church has become very much, has kind of brought on this attitude. But then now way over here, all this stuff over here is also influencing the church in ways that it should not. So on both ends here, we've seen so many messages that, that maybe seem Christian, just enough Christian in there. They also influence the church. We hear things like, well, love is love. As long as you love someone, it doesn't matter who you marry, those types of things. Christians aren't supposed to judge people, but just, just love them. Jesus loves sinners, and so we should just do that, and that's all we need to do. Little kernels of truth buried in there, whether it's transgenderism or if it's this extreme CRT push, whatever it is, there's like enough things here. We go, that sounds really good. And then the church now is being influenced by that as well. So we got influence coming over here, influence coming over there. And it's not good. All sides we can wrongly align with too much with someone or something that seems maybe to have, at least on the surface, a a godly biblical message. And then something, something we can gain from. Right? We like this. We like this message. If I align with this person, this guy, I can gain something from that. If I like this thing here, I can gain something. But the apostles didn't do that. They could have gained a lot by aligning themselves with the the girl, but they didn't. Even though her message was perfect, but they didn't align themselves with her. So we can say, well, I like this and I can gain something. I like this and I can gain something. But we've got to be cautious. We have to be careful. That can allure us into other parts where now we're aligned with things that we should not be aligned with. We have to be cautious and discerning of how much we actually align ourselves. Because the church will become more like the world. The world on the left and the world on the right. The world in celebrity culture or the world in society's norms. Rather than becoming more like Christ, rather than seeing the world become more like Christ. What are we saving people into, church? Ideologies, celebrity culture, feel-good theology, politics. What, what do we hope to save people into? I want to save them into Jesus Christ. I want to become more like Jesus Christ. I want to become more like Paul. I want to follow Paul as he followed Christ. So, so how, do we, how do we keep ourselves from this trap? Because all of us are suspect to this trap, right? You hear things that just, they attract you. You're just going like, yeah, I like that guy. I like that thing. I like that ideology. This makes me feel good. I like this book because it makes me feel good. We all have these things that just lure us away from Christ. Well, with Eve, going back to her, she didn't have a value of God's word. She, she fell for the Trojan horse. Not because she didn't know God's word. That wasn't the problem. She knew God's word. You heard her repeat it to the serpent. But she didn't trust God's word. That was the problem. She knew the word, but didn't trust the word. She didn't value the word of God. She trusted the doubts brought on by the serpent. Paul, on the other hand, had a, had a bigger picture, a deeper value. He not only knew the word, but he trusted the word, and he also experienced the word at work in his life. Paul knew what he was saved from. He knew that he himself was an enemy of the gospel. He knew he didn't deserve God's mercy, so, so this, com- this is what compelled him. Right? Remember what Jesus said when he's telling the story about the prostitute, and the, the religious guys are like, why are you spending time with her? He says, therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, they're forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. Paul knew he was forgiven of so much, and so then he loved much. If you don't understand the depth of what you've been forgiven of, then you're going to have judgments towards other people. You're going to be condescending. You're going to look down on others and say, I can't believe those people, what they do, because you don't understand what you've been saved from. You know what you've been saved from, but you think it's this much. No, it's this much. That's what compelled Paul. So Paul's desire wasn't to destroy this slave girl. 
His desire wasn't to put her in her place, to show her up or mock her, go to war with her or belittle her. And you see this a lot. You see this a lot, especially online. You see these little video clips. So-and-so owns the libs in this viral video. Or so-and-so on the left owns these guys on the right. And watch them destroy this. And all that's, but you see that all the time. Owning and, and destroying. and just, It's just it's crazy. But Paul's goal was not to own her. She was already owned. She was owned by two masters. A physical slave master and Satan himself. His, his goal wasn't to own her. He wanted to free her. He wanted to liberate her. He wanted to see her set free and have a new future. And don't hear me wrong. Paul was also a guy who'd go to toe-to-toe with people who were opposed to the gospel. But when we're talking about his overall heart for non-believers and people who are trapped in demonic ideologies... His desire, his motivation for those who are enemies of the cross, he knew that he wasn't battling flesh and blood. His battle wasn't with a slave girl. He wanted to liberate her, to see her set free. Last Monday, I celebrated my, what I call my rebirth day. 26 years since the Lord set me free. I was 18. I wasn't quite... um, Demon possessed, at least not that I know of. That's debatable, but. But I can tell you that I annoyed a lot of Christians at that time. And I remember a moment in particular, I was thinking about this on Monday when I was thinking about just that day. (laughs) Uh, I was talking with my older brother uh, who was sharing the gospel with me, and he was trying to convince me that following Christ was so awesome. And uh, I just thought it sounded really lame. And I don't remember what exactly I said in response to him, but it was something snarky, something kind of aloof, something dismissive. And I remember he replied, and he said, you're such a cynic. I was 18. I didn't know what a cynic was, so I had to look it up. And in a Webster's Dictionary, of course, because we didn't have the internet yet. (laughs) There was no Google. So I had to find a Webster's and look up what a cynic meant. And he was, he was right. He called out the fact that I was just very suspicious of God, suspicious of people who follow God. My instant reply to nearly anything that he brought, me, that, that, that he brought to me was, well, okay, but what about this? But what about that? But what about this? I just like to argue, and I just like to kind of poke holes and all kinds of stuff. I did not deserve the compassion and the patience that people gave me. I was mocking their savior. I was mocking their faith. I was mocking their commitment. I just, they they look like weirdos to me, to be honest. If I walked into this church when I was 18, I'd think you guys are all weirdos. And you are. (laughs) But now I'm a weirdo with you. (laughs) But I I just, I didn't get it. I just didn't get it. I didn't get the whole hand raising thing and people crying like I'm doing right now. And, you know, just, I just didn't, I didn't get it. It just, it looked terrible to me. It looked, but these people were patient with me. They didn't try to own me. They didn't try to belittle me or mock me or anything. They knew that I needed help. I was trapped. I was, I was owned by the enemy. I was owned. And if they had some of the attitude that I see a lot of times in, in Christians, I would have ran so far away from Christianity but that wasn't their heart. That wasn't their attitude towards me. They were so patient with me. And I was, I was annoying. (laughs) And through them, the kindness of the Lord led me to repentance. The kindness of the Lord, the kindness of the church shown through them God's kindness. That is what led me to repentance. This demon-possessed girl, she was compelled by the enemy, but she was also a victim. It's important for us, church, to look at our, our, the enemies of the gospel. And yes, they are enemies of the gospel, but we also have to remind ourselves that they're also victims of the enemy as well. Now, they themselves are sinners. That they're going to be held accountable. But we have to look at them and say to ourselves, these people are owned right now by the enemy. The enemy has a cover of darkness over their eyes. And we've been given the gospel. We've been given the light. 
And if we look down and we just have this condescending attitude, this smug, aloof, all oh, those people kind of attitude, what, how is that going to, why would they want to be a part of a judgmental people? Thankfully, by God's grace, I, I landed at a church that didn't have that. Paul sought not to defeat her, but defeat the evil that enslaved her. They sought redemption for her life. And this demon-possessed enemy of the gospel, this instrument used by the spirit of Python, we have to remember this, this girl who was an instrument of the enemy became part of the first church plant in Europe. I want you to think about the people in your life. Think about the people you see on your social media feed, the people you see in the news, the people that you are so, that annoy you, like how Paul was annoyed at her. Think of the people that annoy you to no end because of their ideology, because of the way that they oppose the gospel, because of the way they mock your faith, whatever it is. Think about those people. They could be part of the next church plant in the next city over. But they can't if we're just gonna try to own them all day long if we're not gonna actually bring the good news to them with a good and right motive and heart, the heart of Christ, they could be part of a church plant. <laughs> it's crazy. I don't think that anyone that knew me when I was 18, uh, I mean, I don't know. Let me read you Philippians chapter 1, verse 3. And then I'm going to close in one more scripture after this. Philippians chapter 1, verse 3. This is Paul speaking to the church in Philippi. He says, I thank my God. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Always in every prayer of mine. My prayer of mine for you, for you all making my prayer with joy. I just before I keep going, just think this slave girl is in this church that he's writing to. Okay, the Roman jailer we're going to see next week is in this church that he's writing to. Lydia, who we saw last week, is in this church that he's writing to. Paul, who was greatly annoyed at this girl. He's saying, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Always in every prayer of mine for you all. Lydia, the girl, the, the jailer and his family. Making my prayer with joy because of your partnership. Now he's partnering with her. Now she's a partner in the gospel with, with Paul. He didn't want to associate with her at first, but now she's a partner in the gospel because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It's right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. This letter of Philippians was written to these folks. Church, this is our family. This is our spiritual family tree. And there's folks out there in your life, at your work, that greatly annoy you, just like this girl greatly annoyed the apostles. But what is your attitude towards them? What is your hope for them? What's your goal as you ask the Lord, God, why have you put me in their life? Is it just so they would annoy me or is there something bigger and better? Why am I in their life? Do you pray for them? Do you spend time praying for them or do you just ruminate over everything that annoys you about them? You scroll through their, your feed, you look in the news, just, you just get annoyed and it ends there. Or do you seek to truly help them find freedom in Jesus Christ? I hope that you don't have a heart just to see them own because they already are. And you and I, we are to be ambassadors of Christ. This is where I'd like to close by reading through 
portion of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16 to 21. From now on, Paul says, from now on, therefore we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and then gave us the ministry of reconciliation. All right, we all have different spiritual gifts, different talents, different personalities, but each one of us has been given the same ministry, and that is the ministry of reconciliation. You've been given that ministry. I've been given that ministry. Paul's gonna describe that here. That is, in other words, I'm gonna explain what that means. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and, uh, and, and trusting to us the message of reconciliation. So you've been entrusted with this message of reconciliation, of freedom and liberation through Christ. Therefore, so that if that's the case, and you've been given this ministry, therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. God wants to appeal to the people that annoy you, and he wants to use you to do it. You're his ambassador. We're ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us, so we implore you. Church, Paul implores you. I implore you, I implore myself, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God for our sake. He made him, Jesus, to become sin, to be sin, even though he knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's the message we bring to the world. That's the message we bring to the demon-possessed, to the blue-collar jailer, to the rich woman Lydia. It's the same message we bring, and we bring the, the mercy of God to their ears, to their minds, and hopefully by God's grace to their hearts. But we have to first humble ourselves, remind ourselves of what we've been saved from. We've been, be, become the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. That should humble us. That should give us compassion towards people who don't deserve compassion. Like myself, age 18, did not deserve the compassion that I received by any stretch of the imagination. So I wanna pray now and I wanna thank the Lord. I wanna ask him to help us to, just, to grow in wisdom, to grow in discernment. Whether it's Christian books or authors we read or whether it's politicians or whether it's ideologies, whether it's our own feelings, our own desires, whatever it is, all these things that are pulling us that have this kernel of truth but if we align ourselves too much they're gonna pull us away from Christ. Like a Trojan horse, we're gonna become like what we serve, what we worship. I wanna worship Jesus. I wanna align myself with Christ. I wanna be cautious with how much and how far I align myself with different things. But I need wisdom for that. I need prayer for that. I need you guys for that. We need each other to walk through this because the more we have media, the more we have all this stuff, it gets harder and harder and harder to discern, rightly divide between soul and spirit. Between what's capital T truth and what's lowercase t true, which is what the enemy does. It tells you something true, but it's not truth. So let's pray and ask the Lord for just that wisdom, for that help, for that humility, for boldness. I mean, we need to ask him for everything. Father, there's so much that we lack. And um, we know it's just a, it's a process, even just as Paul uh, told the Philippians in that opening, those opening lines, that you're going you're gonna to finish the job that you started. You're going to complete the work that you began. And right now we know that we're not where we want to be, but we're also not where we were. And so we thank you for that. Uh, I know I, I want to grow so much more. I want to change and be transformed and conform to the image of Christ much more. But I'm so glad that you've done so much work in me these last 26 years. But God, it's, um, it's, a tough, it's a tough world that we live in right now. It's a tough society we live in. So much animosity, so much uh, division, so much uh, just opposing ideals and so it's easy for us to just 
go into maybe certain um, Christian theology that's just maybe super feel good or very humanistic because we're just kind of looking for, for some kind of escape or to align ourselves with certain ideals in society that, that aren't truth. And this is why even as a church family, we, we want to even as, as parents just walk through this with each other because there's an attack it's not just going on against us, but specifically against our kids. And so we need help. We need your work in our life. We don't want to become conformed to the images of the world. Whether it's celebrity culture or just false Christian teaching or politicians or whatever, we want to be conformed to the image of Christ. Christ. Not just the message, but even how we walk, how we live, how we act, how we speak. Speech seasoned with salt. So help us. Change us. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your work in our lives, for your faithfulness. I'm so thankful that this week... I got to celebrate 9,500 days in a row, Lord, that you have remained faithful to me. I'm on a good winning streak here. It's your winning streak. You've never let me go in these last 26 years. You've never not been faithful to me, and you never will. And I'm grateful for that. I'm amazed by that. I look forward to that streak of yours to continue in my life. Thank you, Lord. We love you. We worship you. We need you. It's in your son's mighty name we pray and ask all these things. Amen.